Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the uh, Indusoft Building Automation Protocols webinar. My name is Scott Quartier. We have our very special guest today, Mr. Uh, John Rinaldi from Real Time Automation. And uh, today uh, we're going to present uh, some information about building automation networks. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview and try not to steal too much of John's time on uh, just a couple of the different options that are available within Indusoft Web Studio and so some quick ways on how to bring those in uh, to uh, Indusoft Web Studio. And I'll even go as far as configuring a LawnWorks uh, OPC server. So hopefully that'll be good information for you. Uh, just a quick, uh, can I get an audio check from our Austin office just to make sure I unmuted myself? Everybody uh, good? Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, as we get going, uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction of myself and John, uh, which I've kind of already done. Uh, I'll go over the options uh, that are available within Indusoft just briefly. Uh, again, this is uh, not too technical of a webinar, but then I'll hand uh, it over to uh, John, uh, and he'll cover uh, uh, building automation networks, mainly BACnet and uh, LawnWorks. And uh, then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So if you haven't attended one of our webinars before, uh, on this type of webinar, we can't hear you. Uh, we have the audio shut down. so. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to put that into the chat panel or the Q&A panel, and we'll try to get to those either during the WebEx or uh, possibly at the end when there's a questions and answer uh, section. So let's get going. Um, within Indusoft Web Studio, we have a, a lot of different options to communicate um, to PLCs, to different drivers that we have built in for all kinds of different controllers, OPC, uh, client, uh, server, as well as databases, web mechanisms, uh, TCP IP, so lots of different uh, technologies and uh, standards. And a couple that we're going to cover today uh, are, are two related to building automation and how do we, how do we uh, use those and, and uh, bring those into the uh, Indusoft Web Studio environment. Uh, one being LawnWorks, and uh, LawnWorks we can communicate um, by using an OPC server. In this case, we're, we're going to point out the Matricon OPC LawnWorks OPC server. And here's just a few of the things uh, off of their website uh, that they promote that it does. Uh, auto device discovery, uh, security, and uh, uh, no tag configuration. It's kind of automatic. And I'll, I'll show you some of the uh, ways that we can browse to their tags uh, in, in any OPC server. Uh, support for the LawnTalk protocol. John will talk a bit about that. And uh, uses proven LNS technology to communicate to devices. Uh, personally, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, hopefully that's a good thing and something that you're interested in. Then I'm going to talk a, a bit about um, uh, BACnet uh, using our built in drivers. We have uh, the BACNE master, which is uh, BACnet over TCP IP, which is uh, uh, again a master configuration, and the slave driver, which is uh, BACSL. Uh, that communicates not only the BACnet uh, IP protocol, but it also does the MSTP uh, as well. So um, we support both of those. So I don't know if protocol is the right word, but uh, we support both of those. So uh, some things to consider uh, when you're looking at Indusoft Web Studio uh, as either maybe a local device or a, a, a remote data collection device, SCADA type application. Um, you know, managing a whole building or a whole uh, campus, if you will. Uh, of course, we can communicate uh, on building automation networks. That's, that's why we're talking today and why we're all here. Uh, so you might have a single device on some single building automation network or multiple uh, building automation networks, whether it be um, BACnet uh, or LawnWorks, the OPC, or other uh, protocols. Uh, one of the things I want to bring up, though, is that uh, because our communications, and, and depending on the license that you have, we can either add uh, one, three, five, eight, or 32 simultaneous drivers. And uh, because those are both read and writable, uh, Indusoft Web Studio can act as a communications gateway. Uh, so sharing information between other protocols that might be typical in building automation, maybe Modbus, Ethernet IP, maybe on some, some drives, some, some different motion control, uh, temperature sensors, things of that nature. Or it could be between BACnet and LawnWorks, and, uh, or all the above, or, or additional drivers uh, that you might have in your system. So I just want to make sure that you're aware that uh, one of the really neat things about Indusoft Web Studio is to share information between uh, different drivers, 
OPC and drivers, databases, web connectivity, all of the above, so we can be a very uh, uh, neat communications gateway and a way to do that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and show a couple of these uh, things. I'm going to show uh, how we would bring in a uh, BACnet driver into an application. I'm going to talk about the new symbols, and I'll bring in uh, uh, Lawnworks as well. So let me open up uh, Indusoft Web Studio here and uh, bring this into view. And what I'm going to do is start with a brand new project here. And uh, let's see, this morning I called it uh, Building Automation Morning, so we'll call this one Afternoon. And I'm going to start with a local interface, although you might have a larger application. This one is just 1,500 tags. Um, as you can see, we can go up to 10 million tags uh, and as small as uh, 150 tags. So uh, very scalable, very wide uh, range of different architectures that you can put together. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, start this project going. I'm going to choose my full um, resolution of my laptop, although you don't have to. You can segment this up into different screens and, and create navigation menus so you don't have to uh, recreate those on every screen or different uh, status templates or status bars. So feel free to take a look at our uh, PC demo. It shows some real good examples of that. Um, what I'm going to do is show you here first uh, communications. I'm going to go to the communications tab down here and I'm going to right click on the drivers and add remove drivers. Now this will present me with the entire list of uh, drivers that we have. I'm just going to uh, hit the letter B on my keyboard that will jump me down to the D's in the list. And you can see here's the BACnet protocol and the BACnet slave. And um, real quick, something to note, uh, this is the version of the driver that I particularly happen to have installed on my laptop. One of the things that you should always do before you start a new uh, uh, IndieSoft Web Studio project is to go to our website and click here on drivers, not the flyout, but the word drivers here. And this will present you with our uh, list of drivers that we have. And you can scroll through this whole list, or you can just, in this case, what I'm going to do is uh, find the BACnet protocol, and it's going to show you BACnet uh, and BACnet slave drivers. And here I'm going to click on a little magnifying glass and see, do I have the latest version? Yes, I have 3.6. Here's the different. Uh, uh, environments that it supports. So I have the latest version, and if I wanted to, I could either download that uh, or go take a look at the uh, help document or the manual, and which is always a good thing to do. And one of the things that uh, maybe if you have an older version, uh, understand what the differences are. Uh, so one way to do that is you can scroll down here all the way to the very end, and it will tell you what was changed in what version. Uh, and this is pretty in uh, uh, typical of most of our uh, driver documentation uh, manuals. So, uh, also in this this document, and, and there's one of these types of documents included with every uh, driver. Uh, this this particular one shows all the different object types. And John's going to talk a bit about objects uh, during his presentation. But uh, if you're doing a building automation application and you want to see this, does Indusoft's driver support this object type? This thing that thing, um, and things are not the, the, uh, the, the technical term for that, uh, probably not the correct term, but if you want to see if we support these types of objects, uh, feel free to take a look at that manual and, and you can download that uh, uh, separately. So I'm going to go ahead and add that um, into my project. And again, depending on your license, uh, support 1, 3, 5, 8, or 32, and then I can go ahead and, and come in here and then configure this uh, driver worksheet uh, or add additional driver worksheets depending on how I want to uh, communicate with um, uh, BACnet. So that's the BACnet master uh, and how you would tie the tags to the different uh, uh, BACnet objects. Now the other thing that I'm going to do is uh, come in here and I'm going to use the, in fact let me go ahead on a, a different slide here and uh, talk about the Matricon OPC um, for LawnWorks. Now, um, Indusoft doesn't have a LawnWorks uh, driver. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to show today is a company called Matricon OPC. They're not uh, affiliated with, with Indusoft, but uh, we're partners. And um, we often recommend their OPC servers, maybe when we don't have a driver or if our drivers uh, don't support the particular feature set that you're looking for, um, we point you to uh, the Matricon OPC servers. Uh, or there's some, several other companies 
uh, software toolbox has OPC servers. I don't know if they have a Lawnworks one, but uh, uh, so just some other resources there. So here's a link to their website, and if you're viewing this after the fact, feel free to uh, type that into your browser and then and go to the uh, Matricon OPC website. Uh, you can get this a copy of this data sheet. Uh, you do have to register on their website. That's a real simple uh, registration. And um, before I go on to the BACnet stuff, let me go back in here and add that OPC server. Now, uh, that OPC server is an OPC DA server. And in this case, IndusOft Web Studio is the client. So I'm going to insert a client worksheet. And when I do that, uh, that will allow me to tie IndusOft tag names to the OPC server uh, item names. And in this case, this OPC server from Matricon will be the Lawnworks uh, OPC server. Well, how do I get that? Uh, how do I know that I'm communicating with the Lawnworks uh, OPC? So here is uh, the Lawnworks. Uh, normally, you would pick this and then set up an OPC worksheet in their configuration tool. Uh, earlier this morning, I set up a simulation. And um, uh, so now I'm effectively already, just by picking this server that's installed on, on my laptop, uh, I'm effectively communicating with that already. So now I can right-click here in this item field and choose OPC browser, and it will browse to the uh, OPC server that that presents itself in this manner. So this is something coming from the actual OPC server. This is not something that Indusoft configures. And so when I configured their, their simulation uh, items here, uh, I said, okay, let's uh, choose something here for the demo. I'm gonna choose integer one and uh, click on okay. So that uh, puts that uh, item in there. And let me tie this to, uh, maybe this will be a level in a tank. And I'm going to go ahead and create that as an integer. And I know from this morning that that was going to give me a level between 0 and uh, somewhere around 200, maybe 250. I'll, I'll try 200 and see, see what happens. So here is uh, where level, the tag within IndieSoft Web Studio, gets tied to that item name in the OPC server. And if this was uh, a real building uh, automation application, you would have very descriptive names here that would make sense for the particular building that you are working with. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and save this. And uh, again, that was the level, and it's going to simulate some values. I'm going to go ahead and insert a screen here by going to the Graphics tab, right-clicking on Screens and Inserting. I'll create a new screen here. and. Um, Maybe just to prove that this is, is working, just in case I, I have had some graphic problems when I've been on WebExes before, so I'm just going to put a, a basic bar graph here, just in case the tank that I put on there doesn't show up uh, because of the WebEx. I'm going to apply the bar graph animation to it. Uh, if you're not familiar with IndusOft Web Studio, feel free to check out our training videos uh, or uh, some of our other presentations. Uh, we do a jumpstart webinar, usually the last Tuesday of the month, where we show uh, just how to configure IndieSoft Web Studio and get some basic ideas. So, uh, but again, here's a rectangle that I've applied a bar graph animation to, and I'm going to tie that level tag to this. And uh, because I'm not quite sure, we're going to put a, uh, a minimum of zero, maximum of 200 on here. And uh, then I can also use uh, some symbols from our symbol library. And uh, if you didn't attend our version 8 webinar that we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, Fabio, our uh, product manager, showed some of the new symbols that are coming out. And so you can see here that we've got some new uh, ductwork coming out, some symbols, some items such as uh, airflow sensors, fans, heaters, smoke sensors, and all of these can be used and, and will be included in version 8. Uh, some new motors, pumps, uh, some tanks, some valves, so some good looking symbols there. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to choose a, a tank here, double-click on this, and put it on my screen and tie it to that same tag. Uh, in this case, it was the level tag. And hopefully everything will show up when I get going here. Uh, again, I've had some problems on WebEx is not allowing graphics to show up. So uh, hopefully that shows up. And uh, so we'll, we'll see what those values are coming in here. And I'm going to go ahead and save this screen. Uh, we'll call this main. And then I need to make sure that my screen, whoops, right click on screens, set as startup. And when I run, it'll take a couple of seconds to connect up to the OPC server and start getting values. But once it does, we should start seeing some random values coming in there from that simulator. There we go. And I don't think I configured that tank 
uh, to be a value of 200. So let's make sure that we get that in there and uh, rerun this here. And so you can see just how easy that was to get values in from either from BACnet uh, or in this case LawnWorks and, and just how easy it was to tie to that OPC server uh, that I had previously installed this morning. So uh, real quick, cover a couple of other things. Uh, so the BACnet, I talked about uh, the different PDFs, the different uh, manuals that are available. So there's a BACnet uh, BACNE PDF and then the Slave PDF. We also have on our website a couple of real good resources, uh, uh, some BACnet webinars that we've given over the last couple of years. And there's a really good blog article here. And I wanted to point out and click on this to, to bring up the, uh, the blog real quick to show that it's not just a sales type blog information. We put out some really good technical information on there. So if you don't already look at the blog on a, on a regular basis, um, it would be real good to do that. Uh, we, again, we put some real good information uh, out there. So here's an article again on BACnet and we talk about uh, how does it work and a lot of the stuff that John is going to cover in his uh, presentation, uh, a lot of the underlying stuff is is also listed here. So uh, feel free to, to come back and return to this. I also wanted to point out that if you go up to the um, uh, industries section and go to building automation, I guess it, there it is, building automation, uh, there's a lot of good information on this uh, part of our site. So in here is some information, uh, a downloadable sample application for a building automation application. There's uh, about five different pages of case studies from building automation, uh, campuses, uh, home automation, all kinds of good things in here. And then some different videos uh, of webinars that we've done, and also including home automation, energy management, and uh, uh, asset management as well. So. Uh, brochures, and then a whole list of uh, the Indusoft certified system integrators that have told us, uh, hey, promote us as building uh, automation integrators as well. So there's a list on, on there. So uh, hopefully that's some good information for you. And uh, let's see, I just went over the industry page. And oh, we also have a brochure that you can find in our marketing literature section on building automation as well. So with that, uh, uh, hopefully I didn't go too quick and lose anybody, but I uh, wanted to save some time for John. All right. Thanks, Scott. Hello, everybody. Thanks for taking a little bit of time out of your afternoon to visit with us and listen to this uh, this, this webinar. Uh, hopefully it will be valuable to you. What I'm going to be talking about today is building automation connectivity, specifically LawnWorks and BACnet. We don't have time to get very deep in the details on these things. We're going to probably just do a, I, 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 tend, I hate to call it a reader, Reader's Digest kind of review of that because a lot of people now don't remember what Reader's Digest was. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a, uh, a, an older kind of uh, uh, re reference that a lot of you younger people may not understand. So we're going to start here today with, uh, with LawnWorks. And one of the first things that's interesting about LawnWorks is that there is 100 million nodes that have been deployed of LawnWorks. That's a lot of nodes. The reason for that is because that it goes into a lot of very small devices, switches, temperature sensors, and things that you can you know, populate in a building like popcorn. So you can put an awful lot of light switches in a, in a building. You can put an uh, awful lot of, 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 uh, of light lighting controls and things of that nature. So there's an awful there's a, a a lot of places that Lawnworks has used and they've deployed an awful lot of systems. It's been a very, very important technology over the last thirty years. Now when we talk about a, a technology like this, there's three questions that you always have to ask if you want to really understand that technology. We're especially we're talking about an industrial or building automation networking technology. The first is what is the physical layer? So what how does how does how do what's the electrical signaling what's the electrical system the media that moves the da the moves the data from one place to another the second one is how is that data represented on the network every different technology has a different way of representing data and what is the what is the functions and the messages that 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 actually move from place to place on that network. So we're going to talk about that in the scope of LAN. We're going to talk about the six things that I think you have to know about LAN. You, you probably already know that Echelon developed the neuron chip and that every 
Lonworks device has a neuron chip in it. The neuron chip is what's called the MAC, the Media Access Controller. It's the part of the hardware that decides now I can actually put the next bit onto the network. And that's a very, it's a very sophisticated piece of, piece of hardware. It's a, it has three pro communications processors in it that work together to do this. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. The second thing that I want to talk about is that it's peer it's a peer network and this is really unusual. I can't tell you how unusual this is. Uh I can't think of another network that is 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 exclusively peer to peer like this one is. Most systems you have well, you either have a master device or what's called a client device that talks to some kind of server device. The master or client sends out outputs to that server. The server device sends back inputs. That's you know the typical master-slave kind of system. Sometimes that runs request-response. The master makes a request. The device makes a response. Sometimes that just works cyclically, that uh, the inputs come in every so many milliseconds. The outputs go out so many, a different set of milliseconds. Uh, but they don't, the, typically it's still master-slave. This system, and well, the other system we have is that sometimes it's a token pass network where we, you know, pass the token, whoever's got the token becomes the master. Well, in this system, you know, in the line works, we don't have any of that. It's actually one device talks to another device. A light switch talks to the light in your office, and that's it. There's no other devices in the way, There's, and that's extremely unusual to have that kind of peer-to-peer -peer relationship, but that's one of the things that makes LawnWorks ideal for the building automation environment. So now we're talking about physical layers. So the third thing I want you to take away from this seminar is that LawnWorks supports lots of different physical layers. What you have there is that uh, can't you have that Mac, the media access controller, that the, the neuron chip, that's just the signal that just puts the bits out you can have any kind of different physical layer then that moves those bits from one place to another so it supports lots of different physical layers and over 30 years as you might imagine there's been a lot of different standards and so there's a lot of lawnworks variations that use a lot of different physical layers the fourth thing is that what is is the lawn talk protocol you can think of the lawn talk protocol as essentially the link layer Lawn talk is the thing that's responsible for, it's a protocol that's responsible for taking a message from one neuron and getting it over to another neuron, making sure it gets there reliably, it gets there without errors, and all that kind of thing. So lawn pro talk protocol, you could think of as the transport layer, link layer. It is, you know, I'm not, we're not going to be really strict about this because lawn work has a lot of functionality that makes it difficult to tie down and say it's just a link layer protocol or it's just a transport protocol because it, it has a bunch of other things built into it. But for our purposes here today, we're going to just say it's the link layer protocol that creates the links. Moves. It has the link between one neuron to the other. My my switch example, the lawn talk protocol calls what takes the binary output of the switch, the one or the zero, says it's on or off, and gets it over to the light. So that's LAN talk. LAN works is just an, is the whole application, everything else around it, but LAN talk is specifically just that protocol. Now the, when we talk, the next thing is data representation. As I said, data representation, one of the most important things to know about a technology like this. Data representation in LawnWorks is a, called a SNVIT. That's a standard network variable type. So the LawnWorks defines a, a, a number of SNVITs, and each one of those SNVITs is the thing that is a, is a specific data type. And in LawnWorks, you can then connect two different devices that have that same data type. My example with the light, and the light switch, both of them want the light, the light is looking for a binary input, the light switch has a binary output, so they're both using a binary snivet, they can talk. And then profiles are what take when you put a, a certain set of snivets together to create a standard device, that becomes a profile. And we'll look at that in a little more detail in a second also. And then the last thing is that there are standard commissioning tools. There's LNS and others, and over the course of 30 years, the commissioning tools have changed quite a bit also. 
So let's go on now, and let's you know let just take a quick look at the history. What's important here is 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 how long Lawnworks has been with us. It's been around for 30 years already. It's a, it's now an open standard, as you can see. It's an EN. 14908 standard, it's an ANSI standard, but it didn't start out that way. It started out as proprietary technology from Echelon. They uh, designed the chip, they farmed it out to Motorola and Toshiba to manufacture, but they controlled all the technology. As time went on, they, they saw the light and decided that, you know, this really needs to become an open standard so anybody could get on it and do whatever they want, and that's what happened. The Landmarks Association, Landmark Association is is the trade group that they created to manage all of the promotion and everything else that a trade group does for Lawnworks. Uh, now let's talk a little bit more detail about this neuron chip. I'm going to kind of explain this in, in you know, a comparison to, to CAN, controller area networking, if you're familiar with that. Well, you know, in, in, a, in a car uh, in about, about 1990s, Bosch created a you know put, created the can chip and they put can chips in different parts of the of a car for example in the door lock there didn't make sense to use something like ethernet you didn't want to have to send an ethernet message a 1500 byte packet or you know at the minimum it's a several hundred byte packet just to open the passenger door that didn't make any sense so they created this low cost technology to do that. Well, so and so that CAN chip is a media access controller. It, it, what it does is it decides when to put ne put a put something on the network. The neuron in Lonworks does the same thing. It is the MAC controller, the media access controller decides when to put something on the network. Ethernet also has a MAC. Your the MAC is you typically built in to the Ethernet controller card inside or, or your motherboard inside your PC, but there is a media access controller there. And that Mac, of course, is the one that when you refer to a Mac ID, the ID of your, of your, of your low-level Ethernet, that's, where, that's the ID of that Mac chip. So Lon, Neuron, the Neuron is just another one of these Macs, and it's the core of Lonworks. Lon talk being that what we'll think of, what we'll refer to today as the link layer, and Lonworks being all of the application around everything else around it, the snippets and the profiles and all the messaging and everything else. Uh, interesting thing, as I said before, it's physical layer independent. The neuron doesn't care what physical layers you use. And one of the other interesting things about this is that that neuron chip, you can actually put programs in that neuron chip. You can write a program. If that neuron chip has some inputs and outputs, and I don't recall what exactly the 5000 has, but you could write a program in what they call neuron C that could take those inputs and put it into the memory so that Lon Talk can grab it and put it, send it to another device. If you now you can't do very much there because it's kind of limited. There isn't all that much RAM and ROM in that chip, but you can put just put an application right in there. In that case, then all you need to do is bring this thing power, and you can have a very small package create a very small Lonworks node from this neuron chip, and that's exactly what happens when you create things like light switches with Lonworks. And then, you know, to, to, the last thing you need is once you have the neuron chip, then, you, you know, you have different neuron nodes in a network, in a Lonworks network. You need some kind of tool for configuring it. started out to be LonMaker, and now there's other tools that do that. Let's, uh, let's take a look now at the physical layers. You can see on this slide that we have lots of different physical layers. This is just some of the more popular ones. We run... LAN works over fiber, we run it over power line, we can send it over wireless, you can send it, you can do it on twisted pair. There's lots of different physical layers. There's even more than, a, than I've listed here, but these are probably the most popular ones. What's missing from the list, of course, is Ethernet. Why is an Ethernet in, this, in that list? Well, I you know, kind of just started to, to describe that a little bit earlier. Ethernet has its own MAC. It's a different standard for signaling. So the Ethernet MAC puts bits out at a different time and rate than the CAN MAC, which puts things out at a different time and rate than, say, a, a neuron MAC would do. So you, you really can't mix uh, Lonworks and Ethernet. What you can do, and what's been done uh, lately over the last few years, has been a lot of Ethernet tunneling. 
So what you can do is you could have one neuron controller send a, send a message out. That message then gets picked up. The packet goes on into, say, a TCP or UDP packet, travels over an Ethernet link to another node. That node then unpacks that packet, grabs the data, puts that into a a long talk packet and sends it on to the target device. So you can use it for extending LAN networks and for replacing pieces of LAN networks, but you really can't use Ethernet as the physical signaling for a LAN works network. Though they are trying to figure out a way to do that. I don't know that they will be successful, but I'm sure there's people working on that. So that's you know that's the physical layer. We, let's talk some more about now the next big important part, the data representation. Data in a in a LANWORKS network is represented by the standard network variable types. That's what we call a snivets. Snivets are nothing more than that predefined item of data. They have a particular type, and you can only connect, as I said before, snivets of the same type together. LANMARK the a trade association for lawn work has, has has defined all the standard snippets. So there are that's and that's what drives the interoperability of lawn works because every device is going to be is to always going to use standard snippets. You know that if you if your device has standard snippets and that device has standard snippets, you'll be able to connect them together, doing what's called binding. Binding is the process where you connect actual physical I.O. to the snippets, and then that snippet gets connected to another snippet someplace else. So Lontalk is, and Lontalk is really the facility, the protocol that links these things together. Now, I haven't used these in the, in, in, yet, but there's, they have something called user network variable types. So beyond the standard snippets, they made this extensible now, so people can come up, mostly manufacturers, and create their own network variable types. Kind of uncertain how that works because, uh, you know, if, if you're making your own network variable type, how do you connect that? You can't connect that to any standard type. You can only connect it to the same type. So it would be only good for connecting devices of your own manufacturer together. And maybe that's the what they want to do. So when you take a bunch of snippets and you bring them together, and what you get is a, and say this is what is, and standardize that for a particular kind of device. You get what's called a profile. So, for example, if we look at a 80.60, this is a a list of the profiles. I pulled this list off of the Lawnmark Association website. Thermostats are, are profile 80.60. So those would have some list of mandatory snippets that are going to be in the thermostat, and then some list of optional snippets that would be there too. And those would be all standard snippets that everybody knows about, so it would be easy to connect the output of that thermostat, probably a temperature value, to some other input someplace else. So, so profiles are very important, and that's one actually one of the things you want to look at if you're going to use a device, what profile does it have? Um, the tools are kind of cool. The, you know, the tools that they've been using over the years, as I said, these tools, tools have changed a lot, and they're still changing. Uh, they've all been integrated on top of it, Microsoft Visio. And the way it works is that you draw, you take the input or output from one device, and you just draw a line from there over to the complementary input or output on the other device. So you take an input, connect it to an output, take an output, connect it to an input, and there you go, and that's how you do this peer programming. Well, it's not really, I wouldn't call it programming. You're just setting up communications links is all you're doing. So it's pretty cool, and, it, and these tools do a lot more now than just doing uh, configuration like this. They do network management and a whole bunch of other stuff, and these tools have gotten lots, very, very advanced in the last few years. Applications for this, this, well, the big one that Echelon does is lighting systems. Echelon is is really into lighting systems, used a lot of lawn works and the lighting systems, and you know that's what gets that node count up because there's a lot of individual lights that you might want to talk to. Energy systems, good place to use lawn works, HVAC, home automation. Uh, these are all the, you know, the standard kinds of things that you would expect. 
Let's take a look now at, uh, at some of the strengths and weaknesses that we have in, in Lawnworks. There's the first you know, strength is there's no controller required. Every other network requires a controller. This one doesn't. This supports lots of physical layers. Um, you know, some other networks don't support many different physical layers. The configuration is pretty simple. The architecture is pretty easy to understand. And you have that massive base of installed nodes. And one of the cool things about Lawnworks, too, is there's online cer certification, which I'll talk about in a second. No, but it does have weaknesses. The first weakness is that there's silicon required. It's, you know, when, during Scott's presentation, you noticed that he had to use an OPC server in order to connect to Lawnworks. The reason for that is that you need, the, you need that he doesn't have silicon to the neuron chip inside his laptop. So you have to connect up to some box that has that neuron chip. So you always need to get hardware involved. It's kind of a weakness in today's day and age. Uh, there's limited integration with Ethernet, IP, Ethernet, and the intellect, you know, internet protocols. Um, as, as I said, they've, they're working on that. They're using it for tunneling, but you know, today pretty much the I, IoT is all about Ethernet. Everything's about Ethernet. So the fact that LAN doesn't do Ethernet, it's a pretty big limitation. There's also a bunch of data limitations you have on the neuron chips. You know, these things are designed for small devices there's you know there's designed for things like thermostats and light switches but if you want to put a whole chiller on lawnworks well you know that becomes you know a chiller can have hundreds if not a, a, a thousands of data points when you talk about a a big chiller um you know and so you've got you you're you're fairly limited on you know in a lot of ways you're limited in the hardware you're limited in software so there's a lot of limitations to doing any kind of system that has lots of data points. Um, there's some security vulnerabilities, and you know I'll gladly give them a pass on this. When 30 years ago, and, and as ladware has been developing over the last 20 years, nobody thought about security, and so the fact that it has vulnerabilities is not surprising. Uh, one of the, the knocks on Lawnworks over the, over the years, and I haven't gone out to buy any new Lawnworks hardware, but the tools have always been pretty expensive. They've been pretty proprietary. There hasn't been a lot of anybody that really has gone into that market whole hog and said, hey, we'll do a Lawnworks tool because Echelon, Echelon really owns the technology, owns the chip, so it's pretty hard to compete with them because if you're a customer, you want to buy the Echelon stuff. That, that, that's the part, that's the tool that you think is going to have the, that's going to be best integrated with, with your devices. And it's, of course, non-deterministic, but we don't really care because we're doing building automation. Uh, the, the association that runs Lawnworks uh, is called Lawnmark. It's a standards body, and it does promotes the technology and does all the standard stuff that you would expect of, a, of an industry trade group. You can go to the, to the Lawnmark website, and you can see a list of certified products, and you can uh, uh, see you know, what's been certified, what's available for you to use, all that kind of thing. Uh, manufacturers can get their can get their device certified. If they do get them certified, they can use this Lawnmarks logo and uh, put that on their product literature. And the interesting thing about certification, which is totally different than everybody else's, is that it's web based. You don't have to actually go to some lab someplace with your device under your arm and and ask them to certify it. They, you can get it done over the internet. So that's pretty cool. So, all right. So we, we've kind of got we've gone through, you know, a real short, quick reader's digest, brief introduction to Lawnworks. So now, what's the future of it? You know, in this day and age, the IoT and Ethernet. What what what, what do we think is going to happen? Well, the first question I have is, where's Echelon heading? If you if you look at what Echelon is doing, they really are trying to position themselves as an IoT company. You know, do the Internet of Things. So where does Lawnworks fit in with the Internet of Things? Internet of Things is a Ethernet kind of technology or set of technologies. But so is Echelon supporting Lawnworks? I'm sure the company line is that, oh, absolutely, it's still a viable technology. We want it. We're going to support it, da-da-da. But, you know, you have to look at what they do and not what they say. And I, mean, I, I have my concerns there. 
how does it survive in the age of Ethernet? It's kind of tied in with that. You know, everything is changing. Everything's going to Ethernet. This is not a Ethernet kind of protocol. Well, the, the point I would make about this is the, is the places where you would use LANWorks would be the places like where you have small amounts of data that have to go from one node to another in a very in a in a in a, in a you know short distance over a short distance. So LANWorks would probably be pretty good for for that. So uh, you know, LAN works over power line work very well in in some in a in a building application like here in my office to connect the light switch up to the lights or to do some other little jobs like that. So I think just like can is surviving in in places like a car because it's never going to be feasible to turn on your right headlight with Ethernet. You're going to always want to send that over a low-cost network that just carries I.O. You will find out there will be applications for lawn work. So I certainly don't expect it to go away, but I probably see it as more of a niche kind of network in the future. And, you know, the big, another big question about the future of lawn works is governments. You know, the go- governments own more buildings than any, any, anybody else. They're the biggest owner of buildings. Federal governments, state governments own huge, massive numbers of buildings, and they've been big customers of Lawn Works, especially the military. The Pentagon owns, they own a ton of buildings, and they've been huge customers of Lawn Works. So is that going to continue in the future? You know, it's hard to say. I will, I'll never venture opinion on what government may do or may not do. So so that that pretty much ends the Lawn Works portion of this. So now we're going to we're going to kind of go into the into backnet here and talk about backnet. We're going to start with the same kinds of things that we did with for for uh LAN. What what are the six things that you absolutely have to know about backnet? First one's kind of trivial. Where does the name come from? Building Automation Control Networking. Very simple. You probably knew that. Two main physical layers in backnet. IP, which is the ethernet part, and MSTP, which is co- operates over RS-485. Just like LAN works, you know, over the last 25 years, there have been lots of different physical layers that they've tried. They even tried, you know, when they say BACnet IP, they're really talking about TCP, but they also had a version of BACnet that just went over regular Ethernet, didn't use the TCP layer. So, you know, there's all sorts of other physical layers, but the two main ones that you that are being in, they being used today and deployed regularly are Ether or BACnet IP and BACnet MSTP, the RS-485 one. We'll talk more about those in a minute. BACnet is object oriented. That's another third thing I want you to remember from this. Objects, just like LanWorks was all about snivets, BACnet everything is is about objects. And Scott showed the, some BACnet objects in some of the Indusoft documentation before. Those objects are, represent physical inputs, outputs, software processes, whatever it is. They represent the data of your device, as and they they print, they put it out as objects. BACnet defines that, and there's 23 standard of objects. So this is where the interoperability of BACnet comes in. You know that every device is going to be based on objects, and you know every object in the device is going to be one of those 23 that you understand. So you'll know what all the properties, which is the data of the object, are by the by, by looking at its type, which itself is a property. Fifth thing is that the common messages are read property and write property. There's a lot of other messages that that can go go on a backnet network, but the main ones that are used most often are, hey, give me your give me this property, or here I want to set the value of this property. Some of those properties are going to be read only, some are write only, and so on. And of course, certification. Backnet products can be certified. You have to take it to a test lab, and then you get the BTL logo. Uh, a little bit about history. This, the difference with Backnet with LawnWorks is Backnet was started as a by the ASHRAE organization and the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning, and it was started as a, a committee. It was, it was designed by committee, so it took you know, six, seven years to do. Echelon was able to do LawnWorks much faster. 
they started at the same time. They got theirs done quickly because it was just a single company putting it out. And this was a bunch of companies working together. And then they they redid it six years later in 2001. And then it you know eventually they became standards in Europe and in the U.S. And they established a set of test labs where you can get things tested. Okay, objects. Let's go back to objects. We saw objects in Scott's presentation. And I've got a little piece of a few of the properties of an object on the right. So the property names are along the left, and their current values are, in case of status flags, or, well, that could be the set of stat, each of the status flags that's available, um, is on the right. So those, so every object looks like this. It's got a property name, and then it's got a value. Um, and the BACnet specification defines for every one of those 23 standard object types what all the properties are in those. Uh, there's a particular object called the device object. That device object is required. It'll be in every, every BACnet device so that you can always access the device object and find out information about, about the device. Um, Objects can have, you know, properties that can have unli really unlimited numbers of properties. And some of these properties can be read-only. For example, the high limit and low limit of this uh, oven temperature, probably that might be a read-only property. I don't know. Uh, it could be. You could be write-only. It could be read-write. And these properties are accessed by BACnet functions. A BACnet device is nothing more than a set of objects. It's got you got the device objects, and then I show on the bottom right here some binary inputs, some analog inputs, analog outputs, and a, a loop object, whatever it is. That goes up, you know, it gets accessed by a controller, and the controller can normally that's all it's going to do: read and write properties. There's going to be some other things, but for the most part, reading and writing properties is what it does all day long. The BACnet messaging, there's a full suite of messages that that client could send to the server or a master could send to a slave in case of MSTP. But the most of the time, it'll just do the read property and the write property. When we, get to, when we talk about physical layers, we've got two physical layers. The RS-485 is kind of interesting. Of course, this, this was there long before Ethernet was available, that people used RS-485. Now, there's a lot of confusion about the master-slave situation on our uh, on BACnet. It's called BACnet MSTP. There really is no master. There is no master-slave relationship in BACnet MSTP. That's really just a token passing network where any individual device, once it gets the token, it then becomes the master, and it can then read and write objects to other. Other, other devices on the network. So, yes, you always have one master, and uh, you the rest are slaves, but, that ma but who that master is changes from moment to moment. So that's RS-485. That's a differential network that operates on 5 volts. So here we have a neuron chip, and that neuron uh, – no, sorry, we're talking about LAN, thinking LAN works. We don't have a neuron chip. Here we have an RS-485 driver that's creating the physical signaling to put bits on that network. On the other hand, the other often used network is BACnet IP. It shouldn't probably, sh well, that, that goes over Ethernet. So you have an IP in that case. You do have a, a, a real IP client device, and you have servers. And that client forms, reads, does things like read properties and write properties of all of those servers. So if one of those servers was a meter and that client was collecting energy data, it might read the kilowatts from that server every half hour or every five minutes whenever it wanted to just by sending a read property message to, the, to those servers if they were all energy meters, for example. So that works over Ethernet, over Ethernet TCP, there's actually a TCP connection between the client device and each of the servers. So those are the two main physical layers. Like I get, said again, there are a, lots of other physical layers. These are the two that are normally used. Applications, yeah, standard applications that, that are the same as LonWorks, and you know you find BACnet in, in, in the same kinds of places. 
Um, strength and weaknesses of it. The strength is back then's pretty simple. You've got two. You got the the the, the RS four eighty five kind of uh, network for if you've got it going short distances. You could use Ethernet. You could go to wireless Ethernet. A lot of government support for BACnet also. Uh, the, lots of state governments, I think 25 or 30 state governments, have now said that all of their state buildings need to be controlled by, uh, by BACnet. They've, they've standardized on that. Why are they doing that? Because they want energy data out of those buildings. They want in order to in order you can't cut energy in, until you know how much you're using, and to know how much you're using, you got to measure it and you got to collect the data. They've defined the fact they've decided that BACnet is the way they want to do that, and then you know also strength of BACnet is Johnson Controls and Siemens and Honeywell. You know they they all support BACnet. They all support LineWorks too. So that's you know pretty much the same strength of both of them. Weaknesses: there's not much in the way of throughput on BACnet. Uh, you're Generally, you're reading a single property. You can read multiple properties, but uh, a lot of older devices only support the, the read single property message. There's some data. T there's some limitations in in what, in what you can read and how often you can read it. There's security vul vulnerabilities. Exactly what I said before. You know, no one th was thinking about security, so that's not built into the protocol, and it's not deterministic. On the whole, there's not a lot of weaknesses to you for, for BACnet. ASHRAE is the trade group that handles this. It's the one that developed BACnet. It sponsored it. They do certifications. They list this. Again, same kind of thing. You go there, see what products have been certified. they got a show in Las Vegas and one in Chicago. Every year they, sw they switch, I think, from one to the other. So this year I think the ASHRAE is in Orlando, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, BACnet certification, that testing's done at the BTL lab, so you can, you know, you can you have to take a device physically there to to get it certified. So future of BACnet, uh, because of the fact that it's Ethernet based, that's going to make it very popular and 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 become a uh, and and keep it in the forefront of uh, of today's technology. So that's that's really good. That's I'd say I'd say that's a a reason to believe that BACnet's going to be very strong and well used in the future. The fact that all those state governments have uh, ha have standardized on it that means that there's going to be a lot of BACnet devices, and then then commercial building the commercial buildings will be able to use those same kind of devices. So I think that that bodes well for the future of BACnet, and the technology is well defined and and useful and has everything that's needed for. HVAC kind of application, so I don't. I don't really see any re, any impediments to BACnet in the future. So that concludes that. I want to talk just a minute about what we do here at Real Time Automation. We pretty much do gateways. We're a, a gateway manufacturer. We move messages from all of these kind of protocols from here to there, and we also sell source code for Ethernet IP and BACnet and OPC and all sorts of other things. Right now, we've been working on OPC UA, which is the successor to the classic OPC kind of architecture, which was only available on Microsoft Windows. OPC UA is scalable, and you can put that on any kind of device, and that's going to have uh, some interesting implications for the uh, building automation market, because you'll be able to take a meter and hook it up to Ethernet, and instead of having to send it to a local controller, you could send that right to some server uh, in the cloud someplace. So it's kind of interesting. Makes things It's going to make things interesting in the future. Uh, I've got a newsletter that you might want to sign up for. We talk about it's a newsletter that, that has something to do with about automation, but not entirely. I, I, I write you know, interesting articles about, for example, how I got swindled out of 400 euros on the streets of Italy. Wrote an article about, you know, my father when my father passed away. So you never know what you might read in the RTA newsletter. Plus, we always have an article on a technology. We have free gifts every month, every other month. We do this six times a year. You can find out some trends. So, so if you want, you can sign up for that by the with using the contact us button on our website. Or today and for the rest of this week, if you send us a, if you go do a contact us, you go to our website and do the contact us tab at the top right. You will get 
on one of the books I've written free. We have a book on OPC UA. It's a kind of a quick overview of what that technology is. I've written a book on Modbus, and you go, Modbus, it's 2015. And, well, there's still a lot of Modbus, and there's still a lot of new people who don't know Modbus. So if you've got some somebody in the office that doesn't understand Modbus and you want a book about Modbus, feel free to contact us. We'll send you the Modbus book is, that should be available in about three weeks. And then we took a, I've been writing white papers for the last 30 years. We're, we're binding those all up into a book, and we'll have a, a, a technology white paper book available, too. So those are some free gifts just for uh, for joining in today. So uh, I want to thank every, each and every one of you for being present on the, on the webinar today, and thanks, Scott and Indosoft, for asking me to participate. It's been a good time. I enjoyed it because I love talking about this kind of technology. So thanks, Scott. John, hey, uh, wow, really, thank you. Uh, uh, I thought I learned some stuff this morning. I learned more this afternoon. Uh, really <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, John, can I have you go back a couple of slides to uh, uh, probably three or four slides? There was a different, uh, let's see, there was uh, uh, lighting and energy and, oh, uh, yeah, that one right there, 23. Yep. Uh, you know, while we open it up here for questions, I just wanted to remind people that uh, we can't hear you on this type of uh, WebEx. So if you have any questions, put those into the chat panel or the Q&A panel. But uh, I wanted to ask, you know, as, as you've been around uh, in general building uh, automation applications, what are you seeing people typically using building automation for? Is it to monitor the devices? Is it comfort? Is it lighting scenes? Or is it uh, really driven by energy? Right now, um, the big thing that of the last five, six years has been the energy. Everybody's worried about energy prices are going to go up. We need to know, you know, how much is we using on the third floor and on the, versus the fourth floor and the fifth floor, and then on the third floor, how much is the the laboratory in the back using versus the office in the front, and you know all that kind of stuff. They want to know where their energy is being used. That's the number one driver uh, of of putting in a lot more metering, and the metering is being done with Lonworks, Backnet, sometimes Modbus. RTU, sometimes Modbus TCP. I mean, it depends on what meters they get. Uh, lots of times, the, the the engineer that specs that out will, you know, will pick that and decide what that's going to be, what those meters are going to be, and then they look and say, well, the, this meter that he specced out only, you know, only supports Modbus TCP. So now we have to get Modbus TCP and, and, and get that data into the control system and start collecting data from that. But it's definitely energy. I mean, every, um, all of these, every, there's a mandate, you know, from all state governments and all federal governments that we've got to reduce energy usage. So you can't do that unless you meter it. And you don't know what the data is unless you can collect it and transport it over uh, a building automation protocol. Great, great. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you kind of a leading question. I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but I know we were, Intisoft was involved in, a, in an application where we monitored about uh, between somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 uh, buildings uh, for a particular company. And there were some buildings that saw a return of 40% uh, of their energy usage. Uh, you know, they were comparing things well, like stores that were similar uh, latitude well, or similar let, weather, let me, weather patterns. Well, let me let me let me jump in on that because I sure. I, were, I worked on that too. You know, um, oh, that yeah, project. Right. You know, I totally forgot that you did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that project was a fast food company. Um, somebody yeah. makes square hamburgers, so I don't I don't know who that might be. Uh, um, yeah. But they, <laughs> they 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 realized that if they increased the temperature in the restaurants two degrees in the summer, lowered it two degrees in the winter, they could save seven million dollars a year. So that's that's, that's the kind of feedback you get, you know, for for doing incredible. this kind of monitoring. Seven million dollars yeah. a year, and that was that was. You know, that's got to be 10 years ago now, so that's maybe 2005. So so that's probably, you know, 10 or $12 million today's dollars. Yeah, I, yeah. I, was, I was on my way to asking you what do you think is typical of, of, of you know, uh, those are those are 
uh, probably not typical results, but uh, what do you think is kind of typical, either percentage-wise or dollar-wise? Well, uh, I have no – yeah, that, there, there's so many variables in that, Scott. Okay. The, you know, the age okay. of the building, the materials that were used to construct it, how many windows they have, what kind of windows. I mean, it's just – yeah. There's an infinite yeah. number of, of variables there, and the, the, there's an interesting fact I learned when we were doing that project, that every time you're driving by a fast food place, think of that as a mini steel mill, because on a square foot basis, a fast food outlet uses the same amount of energy as a steel mill. Very interesting, yeah, with all the heaters and fryers and well, yeah, yeah the I fryers. Thought about that way. That's great. And that was that, that was one of the objectives of that project we worked on. Is they wanted corporate wanted to make sure that the 16 year old who came in to open in the morning didn't turn all the fryers on at seven o'clock in the morning when they didn't you know need 12 fryers until until 12 o'clock. You know, so right. they don't want to burn all that energy. You know, if you say, if you can save three hours of not heating all that oil up all that for all that time. So, you know, yeah. the, the, the saving energy is is really it's all, you know the lighting stuff is nice and beautiful and you know it adds to the to the physical effects. But you know when it comes down to money, there's nothing like saving energy. Right. And while we still have it open for questions, uh, just going to put a little uh, what I think hopefully is a funny story. Uh, I, I did a, a, an automation project at a, a company that was – they were housed in a, a facility that was built uh, in World War II times, and uh, they said, you know, they, how much they loved IndieSoft Web Studio, and they were talking about, well, you know, not only can we automate our factory on this, we can automate the building on this. And then one guy turned around, and he looked up, and there was a hole in the side of the building where there were supposed to be windows, and the hole was maybe 30 feet by 60 feet. And he said, well, first we have to fix stuff like that, and then we can look for energy <laughs> savings. So, yeah, that's so, for sure. Uh, so on that, uh, we didn't have any questions uh, uh, come in, so uh, I think uh, we're going to call it good on, on the webinar. So uh, what I'd like to do is just wrap up here, uh, and which is a quick slide on how you can contact Indusoft. John had put uh, up his contact information. Again, he's from Real-Time Automation. You can uh, find John on uh, his website, so you can find more information about Indusoft uh, at any of these uh, uh, email addresses, phone numbers. You can go on our website and chat, go to our forum, get all kinds of good information. I'd really like to thank you, John, for, for uh, joining us today, co-hosting with us. Really appreciate it. And uh, uh, based on the comments we've had from other people, um, good information. A uh, question just came in. Yes, a copy of the presentations are going to be available after the webinar as well as the recording of the video. We usually take a couple of days to, to get those up on the website, so those will be up there either on our YouTube channel or on our, our website or both. And, uh, John, again, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank everybody else for, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Have a good day. So with that, uh, going to um, – uh, you know what? I don't know if I ever took back uh, presentations. No, I don't think you did. <laughs> I was talking about a slide that's not up there, so let me. Uh, yeah, I was, I was looking for that. And I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do that every once in a while. My, my thoughts, so. I thought it was just me because I figured, geez, I wonder why I can't see that slide. <laughs> so here's the uh, indie stuff contact. Here. John, I want you to call me out on stuff like that because I'll do that once in a while. But, uh, uh, so uh, here's the indie stuff contact information. And again, everybody, thank you for joining us, and we're going to end today's webinar. Really appreciate everybody's uh, time and attendance and uh, uh, fill out that survey and look forward to the uh, uh, videos as we post those along with the slideshow. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Everybody have a great day.